Welcome to Myths Off. This is your playoff preview. I'm your host, Luke Gazdick. We are going to go over the Edmonton Oilers and the LA Kings playing against each other in the first round for the third year in a row. It took until game 82 for us to figure out what was going to happen. It was going to be Vegas. They lose to Anaheim, and here we are for the third year in a row. So on today's episode, I'd like to break down this series, do a little analysis. We're going to have a great special guest on, uh, former LA Kings assistant general manager Mike Fuda, two-time Stanley Cup champion, is going to join us in studio, of all things. Uh, break down both teams, kind of talk about the matchups, the mentality, and maybe even make some predictions. But from my end, I've absolutely loved working on TV this year. It's been such a great experience. The only negative I've had to it is sometimes I don't really get to get into the meat and bones about all these you know details and series that I necessarily like to. Uh, it's shorter, you know, call it 20 second, 30 second uh, clips and sound bites about certain things. So I really want to dig into this for a couple minutes and then me and Mike are, are, are really going to get into it. From the Oilers side, Oh man, you could not find a hotter team right now. I like to give you uh, some stats if if I can do that. I'm obviously not a huge, huge stats guy, but since the coaching change November 12th, the Oilers have the best record in the NHL, 46 and 17. They're first in the NHL in goals per game, 3.76. They're first in the NHL in goal differential, plus 76. Their power play is 27%. Oh, and their penalty kill is just above 80. Their home record, 27, 5, and 3. I mean, that, it's just stunning. If you put them down on paper and look at that, it's, it's pretty incredible what they've been able to accomplish since Knobloch came over. Obviously, home ice is a huge thing, and they're going to have that for the playoffs. And first and foremost, that's where the series starts, is winning on home ice in the first two games. Whether it's taking one of two or taking both, I think that's the first and foremost goal for the Oilers is to use home ice advantage to their advantage and make it so that that ice is tilted when the Kings come out on that ice. Um Obviously, you look to the big guns of the Oilers to produce and to lead the way. Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl, Zach Hyman. I look for Ryan Nugent Hopkins to be a huge factor in this series. On the back end, Matthias Ekholm, Darnell Nurse, Evan Bouchard. These guys have to be good in order for them to win. But there's some secondary players that I think, one, they've brought in, and two, that have just grown and evolved over the year that I think are going to be huge in this. Talk about the influence that Corey Perry's had uh, since being signed, uh, throwing it Adam Henrique to the mix, my old captain in San Diego, Sam Carrick. This team has gotten older, call it wiser, call it more experienced, call it more veteran. Uh, I, I see a team that doesn't necessarily panic anymore. I'm really liking the mentality and any adversity that they're faced with. They have this kind of cool, eh, calm, collected demeanor about them where they're never out of the fight. It's just, you know, staying the course. And I really attribute that not only to the vets that they brought in, but to the maturity that losing last year and all the experience that they that they've gained, sorry, um, up till this point um, has really factored into that. Warren Fogel scored his 20th goal of the season Wednesday versus Arizona. I'm calling him my X factor, my Fernando Pisani for this series. I just think he's tailor made for playoff hockey. He's probably going to play on Leon Dreisaitl's wing, playoff Leon Dreisaitl. Uh, a guy that doesn't mind driving the net, doesn't mind mucking it up in the corners, and a guy that I just think can really, I don't want to say come out of nowhere because 20 goals is jumping on the scene, uh, but a guy that I think can really help them kind of break through and, and push through, um, a guy that you would not normally think about. On the Kings side, I'm really going to get into that with Mike, with the meat and bones of, of how they play, but obviously a very defensive 1-3-1. One, one. We'll get into that a little bit. I know people love the, the boring way LA plays, and we'll break down some X's and O's, but for me, I got Oilers in six. Uh, same as last year, uh, Stu Skinner is going to be a huge part in this and has to make some saves, but should be another great series. So with no further ado, here's my buddy Mike Fuda. All right, here he is, one of my favorite people in hockey, the man, the myth, the legend, one of the men, if not the man, who helped build the LA Kings, two-time Stanley Cup champion, Futes. What's up, buddy? <laughs> I'm telling you, Gaz, Let's go. after last night, I appreciate you having me on here, but I'll tell you, that was a haywire trying to figure out who we were going to be talking about. I know, I had a three-box going, I was watching, watching LA, watching Vegas, watching Edmonton. Um, 
I thought it was going to be Vegas for well, sure. Well, you called it. You texted me and you, you, you called <laughs> it early. This is what's going to happen. And I just shouldn't have replied because I said, no, no, Vegas is going to win. But. No, but this worked out perfectly. And you're like the first person that we thought of when I was like, hey, we'll preview this series, talk about LA. You were the first guy. Um, first and foremost, like, do you, you obviously have a connection to a number of people that are still on the roster. Um, I know for my own sake, like I played for the Oilers 10 years ago, but my heart still lies there. Like I still have an allegiance to them. I feel like I watch them. I'm still friends with some of the guys and people on the team. Um, is that the same for you with the Kings? Absolutely. I mean, on, not just, I mean, obviously I cut my teeth when you were a player. I mean, mine was in management and, uh, and scouting. And I mean, there's 12 people that I'm just off the ice that I was re- responsible for hiring. So it's, it's very deep rooted. And plus with our success in 2012, 2014, uh, when you win a Stanley cup with a group, you I mean, and they've done a wonderful job. We had our 10 year anniversary in 2012. And unfortunately now they're all retiring. I mean, uh, everyone's moving <laughs> Cartsy, on. Cartsy packed her in the other night, but yeah, very close. I mean, they've moved on from Jonathan quick and you see the year he's having, um, I guess the only ones that'd be left on the main roster, as far as guys that we won with would be quick. Uh, sorry, uh, drew, Kopi, and they brought Louie back, Trevor Lewis, yeah. right? Uh, now there's some kids, I mean, Roisy, uh, Kempe, uh, guys that I have in Blizzot was part of the draft process with, and uh, a lot of the assets that they've moved on to build their current roster, i.e. Brock Faber and, uh, yeah. you know, players like the big Winnipeg, the big Winnipeg move yeah. that, that I'm sure <laughs> yeah. this playoff success will ride a lot on. Yeah, but it's it's incredible to win with a group and, uh, and exciting. I mean, there's party at some times that, you know, you have that burn that they, you know, the way things ended, yeah. but uh, you only want good things for the kids and people that you were involved with. And that bond is going to stick around forever. So let's get to the series here. So obviously last night, uh, I mean, it could have worked out that way where it still would have been Vegas, but do you think this is a matchup that LA would have preferred to avoid? It's picking your poison, I guess. I mean, obviously when you've lost a couple of years in a row to a team, it's got to be in your head. But I think this series matters equally as much to both teams because neither of them Although yeah. one team has won the first round, obviously, I mean, I there's you, a lot on the you, you line. You know these Oilers. I mean, I look at Connor McDavid, and I don't think he cares one bit about 100 assists. He's got that burn in his eye. Yeah. This is all about playoff success. And you look at the Kings at the beginning of the year, you know, throwing down the gauntlet that they're just not a team that does needs to have one round success. They've got a they're a Stanley Cup contender. Yeah. So somebody's going around disappointed, and we, I think just even looking at how things have changed in a year. At this time last year, we'd be talking about the Todd McClellan going against Jay yeah. Woodcroft. So two coaches have lost their jobs along the way as these Great two point. guys, Great as point. these two guys, you know, and now we've yeah. got Chris Knobloch, rookie coach and an interim coach. So there's, there's a lot of pressure scenes behind how important this series is to both franchises. Uh, you said about, you know, it being in their head a little bit, like, where, where do you think LA's head and mindset is right now, just having lost to them the last two years in a row? Well, you've got the best player in the world uh, still, in my opinion, who has this burn in his eyes and has told everybody under the sun that it's it's time to have success here. You know, you've got the dry saddle contact. There's just elite players. Upper bust. Yeah, and it's like, but I mean, you're also saying the other side that this is this an LA team that has given up some incredible assets to get to where they are now. And I think both teams probably in their own mind fell a little bit short at the deadline of maybe sealing some spots that they really felt. I know Los Angeles was really as much as Cam Talbot was quote unquote an all-star. They felt that was a position leading right up to the deadline that they wanted to improve upon. And now it's Cam Talbot and Riddich or your goaltending, which doesn't really strike fear anybody. They can possibly be really good for you. And then you've got, you know, the never ending, what skin are you getting? And, and I mean, we showed up, I mean, how do you start? (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to question coaches. Let's dive into that. Like uh, just quickly, they, they started skins last night and you had texted me saying, you know, you weren't too sure about that. Well, it's because it was poor Cobb before the ice was the, the anthem felt, singer. Felt bad the, the national seven anthem singer had out. left, and it's four. And, <laughs> and you look up, and they've started seven straight like skins. That's really what you want to yeah. do with your guy. Yeah. So I want to get into some systems here. Uh, I'm going to pull out the board. So this isn't some revolutionary thing that LA does. It's a one-three-one. So. I played for Todd McClellan and played in this system and people call it boring. They call it defensive, but essentially what it is, is it's only going to happen off of set breakouts for Edmonton and regroups. So anytime the forwards or anytime everyone's standing still, your first forward stands there. He's never going further than the blue line. I'm doing camera and mic. Your 
other two forwards and your other D slide up and they're going to be on this side of the red line. The X factor to this is the defenseman plays really, really low. So what they're trying to do is steer and steer just means forcing them here. You want to force a turnover by the red line just so the defenseman's right here and it's either a wheel or it's a quick up to transition. It is really boring to play in. For me, I felt like I was sitting back a lot. It, like I said, it's not some revolutionary thing, but it has worked a lot. What I see for the Oilers is probably, you know, you have to swing to, you have to come with speed, but it's about finding this quiet area or hard rimming around. So A, they need to skate, but B, they need to be smart. When I talk about this matchup and I talk about the systems, LA's done this two years in a row. I should mention too, they play hard man on man in zone. This is three, they're one and three against the Oilers this year. Um, and they're 0 and two in the last two playoffs. Is this something that they would look to change up or tweak before the series or mid series, whatever it is? Well, I think it's hard to do mid series because you've really tried. I mean, Drew Doughty's come out and spoken at length about how he was kind of had some reservations about this system yep. and he's a guy that likes to be aggressive and uh i think again it comes down to confidence and execution and as you talked about those like i, I love the chalk i have my teaching degree so when the chalkboard comes out sometimes i have flashbacks <laughs> however so I, when man. you think about when you're describing how you think you want to counter you said you know you got to come with a little speed well who better comes with speed than this team here yeah. and I mean it'll be interesting it comes down to uh is again how the game is called because if you get McDavid coming with speed and you're caught a little flat-footed while yep. you're trying to steer you're obviously prone to penalties because he's going to be going at Mach 40 at, like he's just as fast as it gets so it'll be interesting but it'll come down to frustration and I think that's why this systematically it's so important the moment the, the momentum swings of a playoff series and the luck but I think this series in particular one, the Oilers in that home ice advantage that you know they have. And Huge. secondly, is LA having that success with that system on the road? Because yeah. if you come out down to Cobb, now you go back to Los Angeles, you're questioning the system. You're probably, what do we do now? They've got that momentum. So again, it's going to come down to early momentum swings. But I don't think you can come out LA and after this whole proclamation of this is a system we play. It might be boring, but it's successful. But it also, without getting paid, you got it it's hard to come back from like, you've got to get right. it. You've got to provide some early offense. Cause it's not a system that's conducive to being trailing by a couple goals and trying to get another goal. How much say, if any, did you have as a GM, uh, with systems that the coaches instill? Like would you, exact amount I should you, have you absolutely would, nothing. And is that your philosophy or is, is that the majority of the philosophy with GMs? Well, is, would there ever be a situation where you walk down and you're like, this isn't working. Like we have to change this. Definitely not in the play. Well, first of all, Daryl Sutter would have been somewhere, <laughs> somewhere closing the door on that walking generation. <laughs> that would have been like when they told me to, oh, I, some of the times I was sent down to deliver messages to Daryl that just was like, anyways, no. <laughs> Long story short, yeah. I'm sure there's players, and not no offense, but I mean, it, the management team for the Los Angeles Kings, Hall of Famer Rob Blake, Hall of yeah. Famer Luke Robitaille, you know, Glenn Murray, Nelson Emerson, Burge, they're going to have probably, I'm, they, they probably have the confidence as hockey geniuses to talk systems. I know Todd McClellan used to present systems to those guys. Yeah. And then you believe in it. They want to know what you're doing and structurally sit up top and break it down. So this has been discussed. Um, I'm sure away from it all, like, I mean, in the playoffs, usually you don't even travel near the team. They yeah. go into their own cocoon and, you're, you know, Just it's a non-communicado. Yeah. But, I mean, as far as systems, man, at this time of year, if you're going down to question your coach's system, um, then uh, you better get your golf clubs ready. <laughs> you mentioned Connor, and I think that's a huge thing is about him skating and puck placement and all that. But when I look at matchups and personnel, is it a situation where they're probably going to assign a forward, like call it Deneau or Kopitar? Like I see probably Deneau going against the McDavid line, maybe Kopitar versus Dreisaitl. We're talking about when we're in LA for matchups. Yep. But is this a situation where it's going to be more of like a shadow game for, for LA where wherever McDavid is, Deneau has got to be on top of them always? Is that I, how you approach I, it? You know what? I think, I mean, in our winning years, Kopitar would go up head to head with, uh, it was always um, Joe Thornton or uh, Getzlaff, right? Yeah. Those were our big. And so there were some big horses going at it. Nobody had the speed of McDavid. So 
I think that was the process in acquiring somebody like Dubois. They felt that now you're, if your center in depth is Kopitar, Deneau, Dubois, and then you've got your Pest Lazat, who's a great fourth liner, who all the coaches seem to fall in great love with, guy. is that, uh, you know, you can match up. And if you lose a matchup, you're going to, and Dubois let them down in that category. So yeah. this is going to be, a, if anybody needs a refresh button set for the playoffs, it's Dubois and what he needs to bring to the table, particularly what's gone on in Winnipeg. Um, from a standpoint of, players that I think are volatile creatures on their team right now. One is Drew Doughty because his emotional swings are incredible and he's so ultra competitive that if we saw what Tuchuk got under his, in the yeah. Calgary series, if you can somehow get him unfocused on being one of the best defensemen who still soaks 29 minutes a game and get thrown off with either the officiating or the systems. And I think the Evander Kane on the other side, that if you can get in his kitchen and allow him yep. to become a distraction, I was going to say Evander Kane, Corey Perry will be huge in that. I feel I think like you call it off the air though, that that guy, Corey is what a pickup. He is an incredible pickup because he brings, as you said it, there's a levity and a cerebral way to him that he gets under your skin with that, whether it's that, Friggin' look he has, His but straight he keeps them all. Hey, boys, we got this. We got this. That's the one, the biggest thing I've noticed in the back half since they acquired him is the mindset where it's like so calm and cool and collected. No matter what happens in the game, no matter what the score is, they're just kind of never out of the fight. You, in times past, I'd see them panic uh, mentally, uh, maybe not able to deal with that adversity, but I just feel like Perry and then bringing in Henrique as well. It's, it's just a different Oilers team to me that I love the word cerebral where nothing seems to bother them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I love it. But I, I think, again, if defense wins, uh, I think we're flipping the coin on goaltending situation. I think the uh, Kings lefty righty actually lines up a little bit better. The yeah. pairs look a little bit more solid, um, more balanced, more balanced. And then I think, again, if Edmonton were to go back and, and find a piece to add it, it'd probably be another defenseman on the back end, obviously too late now, but uh, it's yeah. quite interesting. <laughs> well, obviously when you talk, but we, we were talking earlier about um, these players that are like, we talked Vegas last night, yeah. if they were going to run Mark Stone off LTIR and yeah. that stuff. But we look at Edmonton who, you know, that decision to sign Jack for five and five, as much as I love Jack Campbell, that's not five million that you're running out into another elite defenseman. That's five million that's in the minors. That's, can't spend, that's money you can't spend to make your team better. I actually thought he might start last night. I, I, I know we talked about skins. The picker Pickard was probably going back to back, but I, I just thought there might be a I chance to, that we'd see Jack. But I hate to say it, but I mean, if you're it's a game. If you're going to throw somebody the wolves, so to speak, and clearly by the the scratches that they made, they weren't looking to yeah. gain momentum. You got to be real careful about throwing your number one guy in there to get pelted. Um, off series question, you, but you just mentioned it. Um, were you surprised that the Kings didn't go out at the deadline? They probably tried, but no additions. I think they, I know they wanted to add a goaltender, right? And I know that the goalies, again, the ones that were being talked about, I don't think they had the salary cap space to do it. Yep. it. It was not even close. I mean, if you're looking at the guys they were talking about, first of all, Markstrom was the key one available. Saros was available until. Totally Nashville went on while well, he throw a 16 18. gamer together yeah, yeah. or whatever it was it's hard to do but I think it, with this series ends and it, if the Kings go out in a hurry again um, or in a, even if it's a longer series the first thing on a to-do list in the offseason is going to be somebody's got to be moved out cap space wise to get yeah. a legitimate number one goaltender in there uh, when I think of the Oilers and I think of their roster I look at x factors in the playoffs call it your Fernando Pisani this year for those Oilers fans out there. I look at a guy like Warren Fogle. He just hit a career high in goals with 20 uh, Wednesday versus Arizona. Taylor made for playoff hockey, upcoming UFA. So there's that motivation there. I just think of anyone outside, basically Leon Connor, Nuge, Hyman. That's my X factor for the Oilers is a guy like Warren Fogle. When you look on the LA side, is there anyone you're thinking of Quentin Byfield's had an incredible breakout year. Akil Thomas, is there someone that you think of that could be that guy uh, for LA? I think, well, I think Byfield, because it's his first time in the show, right? Like, I mean, as being a top guy, I'd like to see someone like him. He's not really a secret, um, but uh, a guy that I'd really like to see. And I had no, I mean, we was part of a trade, but it's just been amazing the career that Trevor Morris had to see, incredible year. to see if a guy like that can transfer into playoff success. Because again, I mean, the star power, the legend power in my mind is clear because there's a couple of Hall of Famers on Los Angeles, right? They're going to the Hall of Fame. They've got cups. But the star power 
clearly lies with the Oilers. Yeah. So there's got to be somebody that steps up. And I, I mean, you've mentioned like the Corey Perry factor. Fogel's a great name. Yeah. I mean, he was let go in Carolina when I was just coming in there. And I mean, he's again, it's the it's the who's going to when the intensity starts to shift and when the momentum starts to fade a little bit and that yeah. adversity starts, who's going to kick in or who's going to be the first ones to think about the ghosts of the past? Uh you know, you've made me think about this. I don't, and I don't want to say that LA is, you know, not great mentally to handle this series, but Edmonton's just been so good at home. I want to read you off a stat line that since the coaching change on November 12th, they're 27 and 5 at home. Since February 26th, they're 11 and 1. Since January 1st, they're 19 and 3. If we go into Edmonton and they win both, is this an LA team that's equipped to handle coming back in that series i think they still have it's a different dynamic being at home in edmonton and being at home in los angeles too especially early in a series there's still that love affair where the fans are just trick last night yeah. they had no idea what a collapse was happening yeah. and they all live happy where a canadian fan base would have it would have been much more Eaten irate a lot. yeah okay and they just all left happy because can't be scores and we win um that's not that it's not an intelligent fan base in Los Angeles, um, but the tr I, I just think if Edmonton grasps this one and gets a hold of it, I don't think they're going to let off the, the. I don't think they're. Gonna, I just can't. And you know him, way yeah. Connor McDavid with that look in his eye and a healthy version. I just don't see. Um, there might be some bounces either way. There could be a. God forbid, there's not an injury, but. If he remains healthy and focused, I struggle to see how the Oilers can't find a way to pull this one off. So, before yeah, especially we... given your your talk about their home ice, I didn't know it was that drastic. Oh, it's it's insane! It looks like the ice is tilted. Um, they've been just dynamite back at Rogers. Before we get to predictions, I know we were leaning into that. Um, you just mentioned Connor again. Most important player for me outside of X Factor uh, is probably Leon on the Edmonton side. I just feel like he's the guy they can go to. You know, if it's not going, I don't want to say it's not going well for Connor, but if, you know, he's getting ice or they're doing a good job checking him, it's always Leon who's the guy that can break through and be that secondary guy. Uh, do you think of someone like that for LA who has just has to be the guy for them? The two guys that have won cups, and I'm not, I mean, I, I think Kopitar and Doughty are so critical because they are the ones that have the jewelry, that have gone the distance, and everybody else is kind of around them as just, I mean, I mean, Louis won too, but as far as guys that are there that need to show the way and what it's like to, because, again, and I joke as the least, to only know what it's like to, I've been on the plane where guys are in the fourth round where they're dragging intervenuses around and having injections and stuff like that to get themselves through it. And then you see some of these teams that have struggled to get out of the first round. Yeah. There's a different level to the mental grind of when you're down, this is going to be hard to come back in the series. Are we willing to do it? And I think... The guys that have won are the guys that can drag the the Kings through something like that. Although I just, as I said, I really struggle with anybody getting to make the yeah. level of intensity that McDavid's showing right now. It's going to be a tough one for anybody. Uh, prediction time. Oilers. Sounds like you lean in Oilers. I, I think I'm going to say Oilers. Oilers in six. You think it takes six? I think it go. I. I I honestly think six because I I think it would start to favor the Kings in a seven. Um, the longer it goes? I do because I think for that to go that far, um, and I don't want to put it back on one game, but I just still don't. Why would you put yourself? I just have this picture this morning of Skinner waking up and like ordering breakfast with twitches. Like, I know. Letting why did you just? Why did you I just know. put me in the in the fastball booth <laughs> and tie my hands behind my back and let the pitching yeah. machine just chuck nineties at me when yeah. I just should have been resting and putting my head towards? And it might not be a factor. He could come out golden, but it just seemed to be a very simple one there to do that. Um, I think the one factor, if you're starting to hear, uh, if you're starting to hear Picard or Riddich it's really something's gone. Yeah. Something's it's gone something's off. Gone sideways, the, something's right? gone sideways for one of the teams. Uh, obviously I'd be remiss if, you know, heavy Alberta audience here. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you for a good Daryl Sutter story before you left. Well, first gads that this is again would require another, like I love Daryl Sutter. We need a whole pot up. I love a whole. Yeah. And they're all good. And again, I've got nothing bad to say. The man led us to two Stanley cups, but you talk about intensity. And uh, I think it was, 
And it reminds because it's Jeff Carter, who just re, just recently retired. Is the guys were on a tough stretch, and we won a huge game. And they were they had, everybody has their song they play when they win. And the guys, uh, Jeff Carter, threw on Three Little Birds by Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Yeah. Don't worry about today. Everything's going to be all right. And that was their way of telling Daryl, you know, and he kind of took two <laughs> steps in the room and heard, and, Dar- and Jeff was like, hey, don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. And he had that half grin and he just he lined into his coach's office like they got him. Yeah. They finally got him. Everything's going to be all right. And then smirk. like the next game, I think we got blown out and he was like, fuck those three little birds. <laughs> it's like, it was so classic. It was like, it was the other thing. Like, yeah, everything's going to be all right. You, I always, but nobody cares about his players more. Uh, to me, he's an ultimate champion. I mean, Chris's son who danced in the crowd for everything, but you talk about a guy that for a guy that comes across as a farmer and the, you know, and wants to come across as that he's hockey brilliant and he's an absolute champion. Well, it's been unreal, Mike. Thanks for your time. Uh, like I said, when we were thinking of guys to uh, prep this series, you were the first guy that came to mind. So appreciate your time, buddy. Thanks guys. Always a pleasure. Keep up the great work. Go oil and six, apparently seven.